we'll get started. And uh, David's already been introduced a couple of times in the last couple of days, so I will pass it on. David Langford. Thanks. And now we're on, right? Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, st start off, uh, this is the session on grading, ranking, and starting to talk about stuff. And you can see the title up there. But I need a couple of volunteers. And I need my volunteers to be uh, students. We really would like students to volunteer. So come on, who's, who's student? Won't be painful. Guarantee. Uh, there you go. I got one. I got two. There you go. Come on. Come on down, guys. Give them a big hand for, you know, some of our... Some of our top performing students, always trying hard, trying to do a good job, et cetera. So you guys can just come up here and take a seat. And OK, so the job here is really pretty, pretty simple, guys. Uh, you know, uh, the state's requiring uh, certain competencies and things that you must you know, work through. And uh, your, your job is. Uh, you, you have to eat some dirt. I mean, that's that's the competency the state's requiring. Now we're going to standardize competencies for engineers. You guys are starting to be engineers, probably. Yeah, both. Of, yeah, all engineers have to know how to know, you need to know how to eat dirt. So got a little dirt there for you. It's got a little some other stuff in there just to kind of make it taste good and stuff. And so there we go, a little dirt there for you. Okay, so all ready to go there. Okay, and one, two, three, go. <laughs> so, what, so you're saying you don't want to eat the dirt, is that? I prefer not to. Well, how about if we, you know, had a time test? Let's see who can eat their dirt the fastest. So, ready? Go. That's, that's not working either. Well, you know, you know, you got to have, you got to eat dirt in order to graduate, guys. You know, if you're not going to eat, eat all your dirt. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to do well. So, I have the. Uh, Screen back up here again. There we go. So, um, well, you know, we have a grading scale on, on dirt. You know, if you eat all your dirt, you're a superior dirt eater. You know, you're going to get an A. You know, and uh, if you just want to be above average, you're going to get a B, C, average dirt eater, D, below average. And you know, if you fail your dirt, dirt guys, you know, you're going to get an F, and F's going to go right on your transcript and everything. Maybe you don't have the right tools. Is that it? Here's a here's a fork. Only only have one only have spoon one. and a fork, and maybe you have a little napkin with your dirt. You know that work. You've got some water here too, if that'll help to go down. So you're going to be graded on a dirt curve. Is that it? Ah, oh, yeah, could could work. Well, you know you can't all be above average dirt eaters, so. That's not working? You know, well, maybe it's this grading thing is a problem. Maybe we should, maybe we should change the grading thing. So uh, we've switched now. We're not going to grade anymore. We've gone to a dirt rubric. So you can assess your own performance in the, in the dirt eating. So if you eat all your dirt, you get a four and a three and two and one. You know, so take a look, guys. Where, where are you in the rubric right now? Zero. Yeah, yeah, zero. That's just zero. That's just not going to work. So, so what, what, what's the problem? Well, I know. Maybe you're not motivated. Is that it? Maybe you're not quite motivated. So, so I, what would what would it take? I'm a eat some dirt. Kid, so, so you're about to see a kid eat. You know, I got I got twenty bucks here. Would you eat your dirt for? Do I have to eat all the dirt? Yeah. It, well, yeah. You have to eat all the dirt to get twenty bucks. Okay. Well, that's a lot of dirt. That's a lot of dirt. You know. Would you eat the, all the dirt for 40 bucks? So, or would you rather just know how much money you can get for how little dirt you have to eat? Would that be motivating? I don't know. Let's see how much they have. <laughs> well, how about, you know, what about $60? Would that uh, be enough motivation to eat that dirt? Or That's a lot of beer, you know. It's a, it's a hundred, hundred bucks, you know, to... I just don't know what we're going to do with kids today. Come on, audience. Get, uh, yeah. <laughs> get some dirt. I don't know what you're going to do with kids today. It's just flat, not motivated. You know, 
you know, and it's really important to me as a teacher because we've gone to this new teacher evaluation system, too, and uh, I'd really like to be a distinguished teacher, which means I get a pay raise, et cetera, but I got to have all my kids eat the dirt. So one of you eating enough dirt wouldn't, wouldn't do it. So, you know, whatever I can do to, guys, to help you guys eat your dirt is, you got any, well, I went to this quality thing. You got any suggestions on how we can, how you'd like to eat your dirt? Maybe you'd like to mix it with some water and do it that way, like a milkshake or just, just not motivated, are you? So, no, no. Well, this quality thing I went to said I should ask you guys. You know, you know how can we improve our dirt eating? But you're not, you're not even starting to eat dirt, so I don't know how we can improve that. But no insights? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I would like a spork. You, you'd like his spork? You know that? <laughs> All right. Well, I see. I knew that quality stuff wouldn't work. You know, I have no kids eating dirt. So, All right. Thank, thanks very much, guys. Just well done. You can... <laughs> Clearly dropouts, not able to work on the process. So. So what what's wrong with the what's wrong with the situation there? Why 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 wouldn't they eat their dirt? Oh, I told them it was for graduation. Maybe you weren't here. You know, I was told that you know, you don't eat dirt. You can't become an engineer. You can't get a good job. You won't have a beautiful wife, fine home, cars, trips to Hawaii. There's no value in it. Well, there's actually a lot of nutrition in dirt. You know, maybe we, you know, maybe we should go over the nutrition. Maybe we should print it on the, the outside. They, they didn't see it that way. Well, they, they were just clearly lazy. Yeah. No, look, he's back there eating cookies now when he could have been eating dirt. What, what else is wrong with that situation? I tried, to, I tried to pay him 100 bucks to eat the dirt. Oh, put it, yeah, disguise the dirt. Yeah, I see. Put it in a cake or a brownie. Kind of thing. Yeah, I never thought of that. Uh, well, you know, if I was to come cut off one finger if you didn't eat your dirt, what do you think then, guys? Maybe you might have some dirt then. Maybe we should put that on our rubric scale, you know? How many fingers you lose if you don't eat your dirt? That kind of thing. So, well, what's the what's wrong with the situation? Okay. Well, why why aren't they interested? Grading them. I put them on a rubric. I uh, tried to pay them. I mean, what do we have to do to raise motivation around here? Spoke about the value of them eating the dirt as opposed to what they would get after they eat it. Oh, I tried to make it very clear the value they'd get out of it. You know, they'd get to graduate and they, you know, they'd get an A in my class and they'd still, still couldn't get them to eat the dirt. Oh, I tried to make it very intrinsic. So is that is that that it, guys? You're afraid to get sick sick from my dirt. It's it's actually hypoallergenic dirt. You know, we've actually sterilized it and everything. There's no chance of getting sick from the dirt. And what's what's wrong? Yeah, trying to get him to do something that. It's stupid. <laughs> okay. So 
the point is, no but kind of amount of games, gimmicks, conjoling, see, time tests, okay, you're going to get them to eat dirt when there's no reason to eat dirt in the first place. <laughs> you can't cover up a lack of meaning and purpose from the very beginning, okay, by just trying to do all these tricks. You grade the amount of dirt you have and... You know, as soon as we have somebody that, that wins the dirt eating contest, then everybody else is going to quit because, you know what, I'm not eating any more of this dirt because we already found out who's the winner, right? So when we start to think about these things, you have to start to think about, hmm, where does motivation come from? We can, we can do things to motivate people. You know, if I, if I put a gun to your head and say, eat some dirt, you'd probably be gobbling right up. See? How, so how far can we go? So why do we use extrinsic motivators? Because they work. That's the great irony. I can, in short term, manipulate people to do all kinds of stuff. You know, I, you know, I was actually getting some interest on the money thing. He was getting up to 100 bucks, and he wanted the little accolades coming from the audience. That would have helped, wouldn't it? You know, people cheering him on and... Things like that. What, how much money would it take you to eat the dirt? <laughs> okay. So people just weigh the consequences. See? How much money would it take? I don't know. If we got up to the point of maybe paying for his college career, new car, say. So as I started getting into this, uh, I, didn't, I didn't believe Deming was right to begin with. In fact, I had taught all my teachers to grade their students to one one thousandth of a point a year before I met Deming. And we were so strict that we were so good at picking out our Val Victorian by one one thousandth of a point. Because we did that because we had too many Val Victorians. This is a really bad thing in school. Too many ch kids achieving feeling like they're doing well. We've got to artificially stratify the, the scores. Okay? So, lo and behold, the whole situation changes when you change the situation. People that look like they're, I mean, these guys were pretty apathetic. I mean, they didn't even try to eat the dirt. Okay? They didn't, you know, they kind of picked at their dirt and it didn't, didn't really matter what I did, they just really didn't want the dirt. So, if you don't have something that's meaningful, interesting, see, personal to me to begin with, you can't, you can't cover it up with these games, gimmicks, etc. So I, I wanted to play a little clip. Uh, this is Dr. Deming talking about grading. That's not Dr. Deming. Style of management crushed in a... In a Got too many things going on. Stop that. There we go. Patient. Arising people. Start for grading in school. From toddlers on up through the university. Grades. Ranking people. Making top people scarce. Only so many A's allowed. This is not a game. In playing tennis. A beauty contest, horse race, play poker, it's a game. Somebody wins. We knew that before we started. Every all right, I have nothing against it. But management is serious. Education is serious. We are so used to, in this country, to ranking people, to being ranked ourselves. And those of us who want to achieve always want to make sure we're ranked at the top in whatever system we are. It's just counter to our usual thinking. And... and even I get a little scared when I think, well, what would happen if you weren't evaluated or, or ranked? Uh, you know, how does it work if I'm not going to be ranked? Will I be rewarded for the results that I produce and the you hard reward? work? You want reward? Yes, yes. I want the reward. The reward that you want is pride and joy in your work. That's what you want. Yes, you're right. That's the first you reward I want. You ask for. But I also want money sometimes when I'm Pay is not a motivator. Sometimes. No. 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 Pay is not a motivator. Sure, you have to have enough to live on. To live right. 
you know, that, hey, is not a motivator. Remember Norton Feller's statement that I think is famous. On the 7th, 7th of November, 1987, Mr. Norb Keller and General Motors in a meeting stated that if General Motors were to double the pay of everybody, commencing the 1st of December, nothing would change. Performance would be exactly what it is now. Ranking doesn't do any good. Or two people want to be worse than another one want to be better. I don't know what we'll do about it. Yes. The question is, is one outside of control in it? Yes. Or does the difference mean nothing? And man must know these things. There is no excuse. That there's excuse for ignorance. That there's a penalty for ignorance. And we all pay it. What is an alternative? What can they do instead? To help. To coach and counsel and help and optimize. So, Judge, we need to develop self-esteem, dignity, joy, and pride in work so that people may be innovative and uh, contribute their best to the job. If we destroy them, they're humiliated. Ranking them destroys them. How has the prevailing style of management crushed innovation? I'm ranking people. Start with grading in schools, from toddlers on up through the university. I think that's replaying. So uh, we, we see this in all systems. And, and when you're caught in these systems, okay, uh, just like JW was talking at lunch today, the reason we use them is because it focuses the brain. We use an extrinsic motivator because I can get you to, to screen out everything else and start to focus on what I want you to do. Uh, just like eating dirt, if I kept bringing out the money, I imagine I could get some mouthfuls of dirt going after maybe a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. Yeah, now he's shaking his head. Now we're getting there. Okay, so I can get him to focus on that and get him to do something I want him to do, but. Even after 2000 bucks, and you eat that plate full of dirt, tomorrow are you going to go out and have another plate full of dirt? Not likely, are you? You're not going to be eating dirt on your own afterwards. And it's the same thing that happens in learning. I can force kids to get a result that the system won't allow them to achieve. Okay? And, uh, but the real question is, tomorrow are you going to go out, want to go out and learn what I got you to learn just because I had a time test to do that. Or I uh, made the test half your grade for the semester. Okay, That ought to motivate them. If that's not enough, we'll make it three quarters of your grade for the semester and we can get you to cram all night long doing that. So all wrong, all fallacies, okay? And, the re and we keep getting sub-levels of poor performance because when we have grading and ranking systems, A, B, C, D, and F, 4, 3, 2, 1, whatever, whatever it might be, um, those are actually acceptable levels of poor performance. Understand, the system is actually promoting poor performance. Because there's a 3, I only go for a 3. Because there's a B, I only go for a B. And I simply weigh the consequences. If I'm a student, I might have, you know, tons of classes going on and everything else. What kind of effort would it take me to get this grade to an A? I don't really need an A. I only really need a B to get to the next stage. So I'm going to put my effort over here and just get a B. Just simply weighing the situation against the consequences. And kids are a lot younger, especially like high school kids. I used to hear all kinds of stuff, you know. I hear... I'd see some kid, he just seemed suddenly motivated. I mean, he's come to school, he's saying, what, a, you know, I don't understand that, I need that, and what's on that test? And I say, hey, what's going on with you? Well, my dad was really upset, I got an F last year, and he told me, you know, if I get another F, he's going to beat my butt. Okay. So all he's really focused on is whatever he has to do to get that score. Doesn't matter, learning's not the goal, just do whatever you have to do to, to get that score. And it's amazing to, in human systems, these things are played out. We don't have to do research on this. 
it's built into our systems. We're doing research on it every single day in every system that we have. And the real reasons people aren't learning or not wanting to do things are built into the system. It was very difficult for me to get. It took me years <laughs> to look at my situation, try to figure out what do I do differently? How do I get a different result? In, even inside a grading system, I couldn't just say, I'm not going to give grades anymore because they, would, they wouldn't give me a job anymore. <laughs> so I had to go through several different iterations to try to figure out, well, what can I do? Well, one of the first things I learned from Deming is there's no artificial scarcity of top marks. See? There's no artificial scarcity of smart students, <laughs> people that want to achieve. The artificial scarcity only comes when we put it into there. You can have an entire class, 300 engineering students in this room. I probably should have 290, 295 A's, people doing a legitimate A work. Not only that, being so motivated to do stuff that they're, they're doing stuff far beyond what the assignment is just because they love what they're doing sake of it, that's perfectly possible. But you won't see it in a stringent grading system. So one of the worst things you can do is to grade on a curve. Okay? If you're a professor or you're a teacher or that's happening to your children, number one, if it's happening to your own children, you should pull them out of that school and out of that class immediately because it is damaging to their future. If you're a teacher or professor and you're grading on a curve, you should not be allowed to be around children anymore because you are damaging large numbers of people through that process. You're creating up an artificial scarcity of top marks. People will do what they have to do to get the score, even if they have to cheat. It's comical to me and what happens in schools, universities, et cetera, you know. All the educational journals are all talking about how to catch electronic cheaters. You know, maybe we should have cameras in. Now we got cameras in the classrooms and we can catch people cheating electronically and people in their cell phones. And see, nobody's looking at the core situation that what you're having them to do and the system is causing that behavior to happen. Change the system, don't see that behavior happen. In fact, you see people cooperating, helping each other at a much higher degree because they're not having to grub for grades. <laughs> See? And they're no longer so interested when you take the grading factor away, they're no longer so interested in what do I have to do to get an A? They become much more interested in the learning itself. See? The problem here is that the learning itself wasn't motivating to begin with. <laughs> I have no use of eating dirt. I don't want to eat dirt. <laughs> It's a bad curriculum, not interesting. I don't see how it's relevant to my future to eat that dirt. And so we just resort to start doing all these gimmicks and games and gold stars and ranking people to try to get them to do something that they, they don't see any value in doing to, to begin with. So in my journey in this kind of interesting because, at least to me it was, <laughs> um, I had to figure out what do, what do I do differently? And Deming taught me that said, when you rank people in a system, you're not ranking the people in the system, you're ranking the system itself of which you are the leader of that system and only you can change it. Don't like the result? Don't blame the people. Change the system. Get a different system, you get a different result. The people are just going to re respond to whatever system you have for them. So I, my theory began, wow, that if I took away grading, that somehow I'd get a much better result than I ever got before. So I took an AP level exam course that I had with uh, students. I looked at the, I only had about six kids in there. And I, I looked at those guys and they all had like straight A's and everything from birth. And I thought, well, there's really no way I can screw these people up. See, no matter what happens in here, I mean, what's the worst thing I could have? The worst thing that could happen was for, would be for me to give one of them a B. They'd be scarred for life. The first day of school, I just said, you know what, this, this grading thing is really getting in the way of our learning. So, you know, I want to think about, you know, why are we here? And somebody said to get good grades. 
I said, okay, I'm just going to give you all good grades right now because I'm pretty sure you're all going to get an A anyway. So there's really not much risk on my part. And they said, get your grade book out. Let's see it. <laughs> they didn't trust me. <laughs> so I got it out, put an A by everybody's name, closed the book. And now why are we here? These are seniors in high school, highly intelligent people. It took us almost a week <laughs> of discussion before we came down to, wow, maybe we're here to learn this stuff. You know, so I did the exact same exercises I'd done before, exact same assignments. I gave people feedback on things. I just didn't mark anything. And, but on the side, I kind of kept these scores because I had this theory that, oh, man, these kids are just going to blow the lights out of this. They're just going to do so awesome because I'm not grading them anymore. After the, after the first semester, you know what I got? I got the same thing I always got. Yeah. I got a couple of those kids that did amazingly well. I did some that didn't do quite as well, and some wasn't quite as well as the other ones. Amazing. And when I looked back, back at previous years, exact same thing. It wasn't any difference. So this kind of blew my mind because I thought, wow, if I take away this grading thing, aren't they supposed to be doing better? What's, what's going on here? And I realized, if I'm not getting any better result than if I don't do it, <laughs> why am I doing it? See? It was just actually causing much, many, many, many more problems. And when you look back in the history of grading, you find, you find out that schools started adopting it around the turn of the century heavily because only, there was only capacity at universities for about 4% of students. We needed more methods to sort of sort people out to kind of encourage only these 4% of students to go on to universities. Okay? So we instituted uh, grading systems to rank people and, uh, okay? and that fit really well with the industrial model. Okay. You had grade A parts, grade B parts when you're manufacturing. You had grade A milk and grade B milk. So, of course, you'd have grade, grade A students and grade B students, right? Grade C students. And then it got kind of convoluted into thinking that was some kind of motivation. Okay. That you'd be motivated to get good grades. And that's where we really got screwed up going into the 1940s and 1950s and on into the 60s thinking that, wow, if we spend more time focusing on the grade, see, instead of the learning, we'll get more people to be motivated to want to finish. Okay. And starting around 1950, the high school dropout rates hovered around 30% nationally ever since. <laughs> Don't want to be there. People soon realize there's, you know, there's no way I can win. No way I can break out of that game and get a different result. So I had to get it through my head as a teacher that everybody could get an A, see? And the first time I managed my classes, I had about 133 students I saw. When I really worked out a methodology for everybody to achieve top-level performance, at the end of the semester, at about 133 students, I had 130 A's, legitimate not watering down grades or all those games and things like that. These were 133 kids or 30 kids, something like that, all got A's. I was so excited. I had made a breakthrough in performance. I saw my picture, the vision of my picture being on educational journals, breakthrough in grading performance, et cetera. Turned my grades in. It wasn't 10 minutes. And the principal was in my room. What the heck are you doing, Langford? <laughs> I said, isn't this fantastic? He said, no, you're going to have to go back and reweight re those scores. Why? I said, why? These guys all legitimately did well. And yeah, there's some not quite as good as the others, but they're all within an acceptable range of performance. He said, you got to go right back and re-rate those scores, or I'm going to put a, a notice in your file. Oh, I was totally depressed, and, and I walked out of his office, and we had this big battle about all this, and I thought, oh, gosh, now i got to go back and try to artificially stratify <laughs> top-performing people to make some more look like winners and some look like 
losers. You know, when I walked back into my classroom, number one, the students didn't even know I was gone because they were all so intrinsically motivated in what they were doing. And number two, they were very happy. And I just looked at what was going on. I tried to find anybody in the room that was off task, not engaged, not really enjoying the learning process. I couldn't find anybody. I thought to myself, you know what? I'm just not going to do it anymore. <laughs> I went back and told the principal, no, nope, I'm not going to do it. He said, well, I'm going to have to write this up and put it in your file, in subordination. I said, well, what are you going to put in my file? Able to have all children succeed? And this is a really bad thing. Okay. See, when you can step back from these situations and, and take a look at it, they do become comical. Okay. But it's only comical if you're not caught in it. See, when you're no longer in it, you can sort of step back. Oh, that was really stupid, wasn't it? Yeah. And then teachers come up with just endless grading and ranking system. Uh, one of my children once got extra credit in the French class for bringing uh, Kleenex. Okay. Another one got extra credit in the Spanish class because he brought French toast on one day, one morning. Okay. And then we get into weighting grades. Well, of course, this has to be weighted more than this has to be weighted. And, you know, homework assignments can't be the same worth as this. And you know, where does this stop? It's just insanity. Recycled ignorance that just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And then this didn't work, never produced really good results. And so what are we going to do? Let's have the No Child Left Behind Act. Let's do what doesn't work on a national basis. That ought to really help us. And you know what we found out with the No Child Left Behind Act? We found out there's a whole bunch of kids not achieving. That's what we found out. Not only we just have a little better data than we had 10, 15 years ago to say a whole lot of kids, they weren't achieving 10 years ago either, but now we have much clearer data to say they're not achieving. You see, none of those things are a method of improvement. <laughs> okay. Yes? It would have been a numerative study, yes. <laughs> No, I, I gave my principal a heads up I was going down that road, and I said, you know, I'm going to try to get all my kids to have A's this year. We say stuff like that all the time as teachers. We say that stuff all the time. Everybody in here can get an A. And then and you manage in such a way that it's just totally not possible. Okay? And so I told him that earlier in the semester. I'm, I'm really going to try to make a breakthrough here and see you know, virtually all my kids get, get, get A's. And he said, oh, yeah, that's really good, Langford. That's, that's a really good thing. You go for that. See, The system does not want to change. <laughs> There's too many people who have too much invested in the system, standardized test companies. You're talking about billions of dollars, on and on and on. But if you're going to do what's right for learning and what's right for students, somebody someplace has to break out of the system. And slowly we're starting to see individual teachers just say, I'm not going to do it anymore. We're starting to see schools saying, you know, this is really stupid, and I'm not going to do it anymore. So. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. It's possible to get the result. That's right. That's right.
There you go. Oh yeah, it, it's it's severe, and it just depends on you know how far are we going to go, you know you're going to keep pushing the system and the extrinsic motivators till somebody commits suicide or many people do. See, uh, when we started working our school in Alaska, we were working with working with Alaska Native students. One out of twelve of them commits suicide before the age of sixteen. No, no hope. They're in these school systems. They're failing everything. Process is not helping them. You you get to 16 and you just feel like there's just no way I can do anything. Oh yeah, yeah, we love that. We love that. That's the crab. Yeah, that's the crab syndrome with a, a, a staff, a faculty. See, if somebody starts to crawl out of the bucket, and suddenly all of your kids start to get A's and start to look like they're really good, right? Are the other staff members going to come to you and say, wow, you must have a whole new theory about how to manage your children. Can you explain your theory to me? No. What they're going to do is they're going to discredit you. Oh, he needs a grader. He's watering down the curriculum. That's just not possible. Well, of course, it's not possible if you keep doing this. See? But if you want to find out this kind of a world, you got to... You Basically, stop doing this over here. You'll never see true levels of performance emerge as long as you keep this kind of systemic stuff going on. Okay, so we have a number of things that start to emerge through this. I've studied this for over 25 years. So, and I have, the, have done trials myself with students in different classes and watch what happens to performance and how they react and what goes on within that. So we do all kinds of weird things like, uh, oh, let's see, we got too many kids committing suicide, so let's go to pass fail. That ought to help them. See? Well, we know that intrinsic motivation mastery is motivating. When you actually accomplish something and do something difficult at a very high level, you, you feel really good about that. You're mastering that performance, see? Uh, and it comes back to grading systems, too. The research is that the only kids motivated by grading systems are the ones getting good grades. That's typically 5%, 5 to 10% of the population. For all others, 90 to 95% of students see it as a demotivating process. Is that, let's, Put this in perspective. You, you did work really hard on something. You did type that up, organize it. You worked really hard on it, right? You got it in, and you're so excited to get some feedback from your professor, and you get it back, and you got a C plus. That make you feel good? Make you feel motivated next time? Now, typically, people get pretty pissed off from that. We're so hard on that. So what's the message next time? Fool, don't work so hard. Okay. So I'm trying to really drill home with you a point. <laughs> there, is, there are avenues out of this world, okay? And you can get a significantly different result when this starts to happen. One of the ways to begin the journey is just to start asking people, what's the problem here? Um, I worked with a major university, engineering department, by the way. And uh, 100 faculty members, and I was talking to the dean one day after a presentation. He said, that, that's not possible, you know. You know, we do all these things to help kids, and they still won't show up for class on time. And da, da, da. I said, okay, go back and ask your faculty what's the number one reason for students not doing well. Well, first I asked him, what's, what's the data? He said, well, we have 40% failure rate. 40% of our engineering students fail classes. 
Now, when people often say that, they'll follow it up with something like, but we're a really tough school. No, you're just a real moron. Any idiot can come up with a grading scale to make 40% of people look like failures. Doesn't take, you know, what Deming say this morning, a, a film takes about a third grade education to do that. That's it. You can figure out a curve, but maybe with a sixth grade education. You see, any idiot can be able to do that. A really tough school would be one in which nobody fails. Not just fails, but excels. See, we have methods to help everybody excel. It's sort of like, we have methods to help you achieve. See? Yes. You caught in a system. Oh, sure, we have to know how much knowledge is gained, but don't 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 fool yourself to thinking that's a grade. That's not a grade. Grade's no measurement of what people learn. That's ridiculous. <coughs> nothing. Has nothing to do with that. No, it has nothing to do with that. You can get fantastic grades, never learn a darn thing. You're just really good at memorizing stuff, a short-term potentiation for Friday's test. And then the research on that says, anybody in here crammed for a test ever? Yeah. Re most of the research says in 48 hours, you can't recall 80% of what you crammed for. Because the brain is just what you heard JW say today. The brain is a selection machine. It's going to select out what's most important. What, why did you need that information? To pass the test. That's it. That's not a measure of what you learned. Period. Never is, never will be. Okay, so before we get to methods, I got to finish my story about the university, the engineering department, right? He went back and, he went back and asked the professors, what causes people, 40% of the people to fail? 80% of all professors said, apathy. These kids don't care. They don't show up for class on time. They get drunk on the weekends. Don't do their homework. They won't eat the dirt. Apathy. What are we going to do about that? We should select some better students. See? We should be more stringent in our selection process so we can get, you know, the non-apathetic people in here so we can turn them into ap apathetic people. See? Apathy. Your tendency always is to blame the individuals without first considering the systemic effect. That's the fundamental attribution to error in psychology. Okay? So I challenged them. I said, okay, I want you to go back and I want you to do a study Students who have failed, students who are currently in the system, and even study people who've made it, who survived what you've done to them. Okay? Ask them what the number one reason is that causes failure at your uh, uh, College of Engineering. He did that, and he called me up in about six months later, and he said, unbelievable. I said, no, it's very believable. What, what happened? 80% of students said one primary reason causes failure. Not boredom. What's that? Couldn't understand, you're very close. Can't understand the teacher. No, they said I can't understand the teacher. So what was happening when they, they were actually advertising international faculty? Like that's a good thing. How many of you are in a class, and this is not racist or anything like that, but how many of you have ever been in a class where you couldn't understand a professor half the time? Look, at, look around at the hands in the room. Now, how many of you were ever in a class when anybody ever asked you what the problem was? Well, good for you. Okay? Very rare that anybody would ever really ask what the problem was. You want to improve the system? 
Don't blame the kids. Have an English pronunciation course for professors. And they have to get above a certain level or you can't have your job. See? Yeah, students have to. You know what? They were brave enough to do that. They put in English pronunciation courses for their professors and actually coached them. Single year, they cut their failure rate in half. Cut it down to 20%. Single year. See, the common causes of variation are just laying there right in front of you. All you got to do is just pick them up and act on them. But you have to be smart enough to actually study the situation, collect some data, try to understand what it's telling you, look at the causes of that situation, and be brave enough to make a change, okay, and test it. Lo and behold, we call that PDSA. He got it. Yeah, he got it. If you, if you, yeah, if you're, if you're in a school or university or something like that, one of the worst things you can do to try to improve academic performance of students is to call a teacher meeting. What Deming said is you'll be off to the Milky Way. You'll get further, it's a funnel experiment, you'll get further and further and further away from the target until you don't even know what you're doing anymore. You're, you're so wrapped around running a dysfunctional system, you're spending all your time running the dysfunction of it. See, because we, you know, we got these kids that might commit suicide, so we need extra counselors to start counseling all these kids that are in a defective system that's causing such pressure and stress that's causing suicide rates, right? And then we got this problem with bullying. Okay. Lo and behold, the, could the bullying become coming from overemphasis on ranking in the system? Okay. Deming was just spot on. And he nailed these things with people before there was even the brain research. He saw it just happening in organizations, destroying people's motivation for learning and achieving. So change the system, get a much different result. Okay. Uh, let me just show you a way, not the way, change the system. Um, we went through, I went through seven years of research, this stuff with classes, etc. We, I did a number of different things. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I had classes where we just took away Fs. We just told the kids, there's just no more Fs. Well, I had one kid come up to me, it's my right to get an F. <laughs> really? I, I'd love to give you an F, but I, I just don't have any of these. So what are we going to do to help you <laughs> pass this class? And lo and behold, he sat down, okay, what's, what is the problem, see? The number one thing you have to think about is feed or evaluation is not an improvement process. Teacher evaluation, student evaluation, professor evaluation, that's not an improvement process. It's a ranking process. If you're going to spend all your time just ranking people, you don't have any time to help them improve. Okay? So what are you doing instead? You have to think about Feedback systems. How do I set up a feedback system? People respect feedback. And uh, you can put this little caveat in there, feedback with permission. So I might come up to you and I see, well, you're not doing very well on something or whatever. And I said, I kind of see some things there. Would you like some feedback on that? I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, the individual says, well, yeah, what are you, what are you, what are you seeing? If I come up to you and say, you're not doing very good on that, you know, I'm going to give you a B minus on this. You know, you know what they do next time you come up? They go like this. Okay. If that, they've, they've just learned you're not trustworthy. Okay. Don't share my, my stuff with you because you're just not trustworthy. So you have to think about, hmm, how can we begin to change the system to get something different to happen? So we took away D's, and we took away C's. And we would A, there's just A's and B's, there's only just two options, because we thought, oh, 
surely not everybody could be expected to do well, right? We must have a category for not doing well. But lo and behold, every time I took away one of those letters, that's all I got. When I took away Ds, I got A, Bs, and Cs. <laughs> when I only had As and Bs, guess what I got? As and Bs. It's just, just the classes, any class. Yeah, that's how it works in graduate. We already do some of these things in places. See? It's amazing psychologically what takes place. So finally just went to either just A or the other category is not yet. So if you're supposed to turn something in by a target date, okay, does that piece of learning that you turn in meet or exceed the standard for an A, because we want we do want high standards, that's motivating. Mastery is very motivating. See? If it's not, what do you get? You get feedback. That's it. You get feedback. I learned this from Dr. Deming. He said, you know, he gave everybody A's, but people turn in papers and say, well, we need to have a little chat about this. I'm a little worried about how you're talking about this con this concept in your paper. Let's have a discussion about that. I think if you rework this, I think you'll have that. And see, it has to be a chance to fail forward because that's built into the human condition. That's how we learn stuff. We fail. <laughs> you're not learning anything if you're acing a class. You already learned it someplace else. See, you're just kind of going through the motions. You're not really being challenged. To be challenged, you have to actually be working at a level where it's going to cause you some failure. You're not going to do things quite well the first time around even though you put in your very best effort, and you learn from that experience. So the system has to be set up so you can respond to that. Oh, you didn't quite, you didn't quite hit that. Here's what you need to do to fix it up. Now, getting that in mind, so it was just pretty amazing for kids because a couple things had to happen. Our traditional system makes, makes learning very flexible but it makes time very rigid. Teachers and professors and everybody else says, oh, you know, it's got to be in by 10 o'clock on Friday. And then whatever is turned in on 10 o'clock on Friday, we just make it very flexible in the learning, A, B, C, D, and F. That's what we've all been taught to do as systems we grew up and et cetera. As long as you get in by Friday, it's okay. And uh, so then the teacher goes home on the weekend and spends hours and hours marking and inspecting papers, right, and going over that and, uh, that, and they come back the next day, Monday and hand them all back to the students, and the student goes, hey, what'd you get? I got a B minus, I got a C, and it goes to the trash can. So who's, who's learning all the, the most in that? Teacher. They get really fast at finding mistakes. And over a period of years, their neural mechanism for finding mistakes just goes right through the roof. They're seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of papers, and they're being able to see. They get spot safe. They get like Zorro. <laughs> Got that one down in three seconds. On to the next one, see? And then we do stuff like uh, automating idi idiocy. It's called a standardized achievement test. See, because, you know, to have people, people grade that many papers that fast, that's really hard. So we got technology to do that now, bubble sheets. Now we can do this a really defective thing really fast. But nobody's ever saying, why are we eating this dirt? <laughs> See? Let's automate the dirt process. Let's choke it down them. Let's, let's do whatever. But nobody's saying, why are we eating dirt in the first place? See, you gotta, you got to divorce yourself from that thinking if you really want to break out of the system. So thinking like that, when you go to a quality world, you make quality very rigid. Quality is not flexible. And today's economic uh, situation worldwide, if, if you don't understand how to produce very high quality products, you're not even in the game today. It's, it's the norm. <laughs> you know, when Deming started, we had companies producing 70, 80% defect free products. And that was pretty much the norm. You see? Nowadays, if you're not producing 98, 99% uh, 
defect free, free products or Six Sigma 99, 99.9999998% defect free products, you're not even in the game. See? Nobody's, no, where our sense of quality is hit, has ridden so high, see, that there are other differentiating factors now. But it has yet to hit schools and education to think like that. So we have to get everybody to think, no, there's just there's no room for poor quality stuff. You know, the joke is always, you want to go to the doctor, they got a C in the exam. You want to get on the airplane where the guy got a D plus on his flight exam? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't mind if he got a D plus first time around, but I'd, I'd like him to go back and figure out what he did wrong <laughs> before he starts flying my, my plane, see? So you have to get rid of this goalpost mentality. Everybody hold up your hands. You got a goal, got a goal post, right? And if I kick a ball to you, how do we know if it's good? It goes through the goal post. School, how do we know if it's good? As long as it's between A and D, you're good. See? It's just branded good. That's not the world we live in anymore. The students coming through the system are often in shock when they go to companies and, peop and people are saying, no, we actually want you to produce very high quality products, materials. We want you to be totally intolerant of making of mistakes. And we know you're going to make mistakes, but we want you to learn from your mistakes. Wow, that's a shock. <laughs> never had to do that before. See? All I ever had to do before was count the mistakes. Change the situation, you get a different result. So we finally also said that uh, in order to get a significantly different result, we had to change the whole mentality of how things are handled. As long as I kept using A, B, C's, D's, and things like that, that's what I got. So all I can share with you is a method for achieving that. So we said uh, there still are target dates. So you can see across the top, there's target dates for assignments. There's students' names down the left-hand side. And basically, each one of these assignments has a very high quality standard set for it. One of the best ways to do that is have a discussion with the students and say, gee, what would it mean to do this at a very high degree of quality? Uh, sometimes they'll say, well, it should be neat. What does that mean? Your definition of neat is probably totally different than my definition of neat. And uh, so I guess we need an operational definition of neat. We can operationally define that pretty clear. Neat means these kinds of things. Now, the clearer I make this standard with students, guess what? More people I have achieving it. Lo and behold. So we realized right away that we had institutionalized dysfunctional stratification. See, a student says to you, is this going to be on the test? Because what they're saying to you is, I'd like to do well on this. Is this going to be on the test? And the teacher says, maybe, read these four books and study all these isolated facts just in case I put, pick one of these out. And then hopefully you guessed right. You ever get in those tests where you go, oh, guessed wrong. Memorized all the wrong stuff. Dumb me. No, dumb professor. It doesn't understand how to optimize the system. I know I'm pretty passionate about this and, uh, and probably pretty confronting, but I do hope that most of you walk out of here emotionally scarred today. And the next time you find yourself starting to rate or rank people, okay, think about it for a second. <laughs> what am I doing to these people? Or the next time you find yourself caught in the system where somebody's trying to do it to you, you know, have the gumption to start to say, you know what, I'm not playing that game. You're not going to manipulate me like that. And watch their reaction. <laughs> See, as long as you keep playing the game, you're going to get to keep get, having the game hit you. So uh, I'm not saying this is the way, just a way. So we went to a one system. And there were lots of metaphors that were attached to the ones. Uh, that's an easy one. But basically, what this means is that if you finish this project and you did it to a very high degree of quality, you got your one. Okay, that's it. According to the operational definition, if you met or exceeded 
Okay, that's standard. You can go far beyond the standard, but, and what's the standard? Standard is mastery, high quality work. But you can see, even in this assignment, there's some blanks in there. Some people were able to get that in on time on that date and it met or exceeded the standard. So what about the people that didn't get in on time? What do they get? Feedback. They get help. We called it relentless help. I'm going to start relentlessly helping. What do you need? See? The guy up there said, can I have the spork? Yeah, here, you can take the spork. <laughs> I get you any tools you need, any processes, anything. What do you need? What do you need to be able to get to that level? Just need more time? Okay, time's more flexible. So you have more flexibility around this time. This is, that's why we call it target times. Did you meet the target? Or, or maybe you were early. Maybe you got it in four days early. The, the ridiculous games that are played, uh, especially at universities, I, I don't know if it's still true, but I had many professors tell me, don't ever hand anything in early. Wait, wait, hang, hang on. Don't ever hand anything early, in early. Why? Because the professor more time to go over your paper. They, they can't expect it. They, they get too much inspection. They'll find too many mistakes. Okay? But don't ever turn anything in early. So Sorry. He said, somebody hands in a paper and the professor can see that, oh, this guy was so close to this. Da, 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 da. Well, see, normally I would just rank that. See, I'd give it a B plus. But what if I just came back and said, you know what? You are so close to this. I think if you just fix this up, reword this, I think you got it, dude. But what do you think he's going to do? Yeah, he's going to go, oh, I got it. You, I, had, I used to have kids all of a sudden, they'd say, I can do that? You, you really let me do that? Yeah, because I'm really interested that you learn this and you really like this. See? And you can apply it. So that's why these projects can't be dirt. They have to be applied, hands-on, experiential things that people are doing, planning, processing, working through. Has to be something very, very, what we call a very rich learning experience. Okay? So this is really cool. This is really fun. And maybe it takes other people to work through it together. It's a robotics project, or it's, see, we all know when you're in applied learning situations, your motivation goes way up. See? So when you finally go through this project and you finish it, if you get your one, great. If you don't get your one, you get feedback. Okay, well, then what happens? Well, the other, the other consequence there is now you got yourself behind schedule. Because now, in order to complete everything we need to complete in this quarter or semester or whatever, this is, these are the target dates to stay on schedule. So this is, this is your way to understand, am I keeping up with the pace or not? Keep up with the pace, great. Life is good for you. You're not keeping up with the pace, you got problems. And one of the problems that you're going to have is relentless help. Langford's going to be going home with you every night. <laughs> but I'm going to basically drag you into high performance, kicking and screaming, because as soon as I can get you to complete that one, I got gotcha. you. Because then I can sit down with you and go, hey, how's that feel, dude? Okay. Now, I don't, I don't have anything to draw this out, but here, here's a trick question. So let's say uh, two papers come in, right? And so you grade them. You say, well, this is clearly a 98. Another paper comes in, you grade that one. You say, well, this is clearly an 86. Who's smarter? Trick question. No, it's not a trick question. What, who are the students going to say is smarter? 98. Thank you very much. Saved us from that misery. 98, right? Now you look at it this way. You turned your paper in on time, met or exceeded the standard, okay, and you got your one. He, he took an extra two, three days. He had to rework it and go home and fix it and get it up to standard. He got his one. 
Now, if you look at these two ones, who's smarter? The sec second one's smarter, smarter one. Ah, the point is, nobody's smarter. And the system's not weeding it out. They're saying, you can be smart too. So the message becomes, what do you do next time? Work a little harder, pay a little more attention, cooperate with your peers to a higher degree, because there's no artificial scarcities of ones. I got plenty of ones. I got a whole bag full of them over here. Okay. So we're never going to run out of ones. You can get your one. Okay. The, the, the kids came up with all kinds of things. That was an easy one. Yeah. You get that one? Yeah, I got that one. See how cool that was? Whole different way of thinking. Uh, usually about two or three assignments in, I'd have some kid that was usually on the valedictorian track would say, well, that's not fair. I said, what do you mean it's not fair? He said, well, I worked really hard to get in on this target date and got my one in, but, you know, he, he took a couple extra days to get his in, and he still got the one. That's not fair. I said, it's totally fair. Think how unfair the current system is. You worked really hard to get that paper in, did the planning, did everything, got it in on the target date. He slopped through it the night before, just trying to get a D to go through, and he throws his paper in on Friday. You get an A, he gets a D, both get to go on. Shouldn't he have to work just as hard as you did? Isn't that the fair thing? And usually I'd have kids go, he should have to work as hard as I did. That's right. Okay. We're holding everybody accountable to that level of performance. But you can't do it with a traditional thinking. See, I can't do it and still have due dates on Friday. Don't get this in. This, it, you just have, ma we already went through that for years. <laughs> you have massive incompletes, massive failures, et cetera. But if you, once you understand the learning code, you understand time is flexible, right? So I've gave you all a difficult math problem. I imagine there'd be some of you in here that do it real very quickly. Some of us would still be struggling by tomorrow morning. But with enough help, the more time, we could get it. See? But you, you probably had a background that I don't have. That you could get it. And that, that is the point for everybody to get. We don't have an artificial scarcity of top marks. We've got plenty to go around. Everybody can get to that point. So what, what are your questions? Or, yes, sir. Nope. Legitimately? Yes. Yes. Yes, and we should punish them for that. <laughs> yes. Ah, so now you, now you understand the... No, it's not. It's mastery or get to work. <laughs> the significantly different... Pass fail means basically minimum level of performance, see, or fail. Well, there's a number of ways to do this. This is what we teach teachers. You can transition. Uh, one of the things we found out is, let's say I have 10, just to make the calculations easy across here, let's say I have 10 ones across here by the end of a quarter or a semester or something like that. Okay, one way you can turn it into a grade, because maybe the system still says you must give grades, is I can say your percentage of ones determines your grade. You got nine ones, you got a 90. You got 10 ones, you got 100. You got eight ones, you got 80. Makes everybody's job simpler, teacher's job. The, the whole point of all this is can you get the professors and teachers to start spending all of their time helping people with the learning 
rather than spending all their time ranking and rating people and figuring out grading scales and grading on a curve and all the rest of that. We made the shift. It's amazing. Almost all my time was spent actually helping people. So the kid you're talking about that's starting to fall behind, now you understand the wisdom of Deming's thinking about special and common causes. I've got all these common cause kids, and they're performing pretty much on target and achieving at that level, right? But I got this one special cause kid or two kids. Maybe he's got a drug problem. Well, immediately within five, six ones, five or six data points, that's going to tell you a trend. I don't have to wait to the end of the quarter and give him an F and say, oh, you've got a big problem. Five or six data points, so I can figure out, do I have anybody any special causes? So immediately, what, what, do you, what happens with a special cause? You get special help. Now, when you're not treating everybody as if they're a special cause, which is one of Deming's deadly diseases, you have a ton of money, time, okay, effort, resources to help somebody that legitimately really needs that kind of help. So that kid maybe it does have a drug problem. Let's turn, get some resources in here and see if we can't turn this situation around. Let's get you a counselor in here, a social worker. What do we got to do to help get this situation turned around? You can turn a ton of resources to that. But if, if you're going around treating everybody as if they're special, you say, you don't have time for that kid. What do you do? You get rid of them. Fail them. Get them out of the system. See? Because we, we can't wait can't deal with this. It's just dysfunction. Okay. Ah, special cause kids at the top. Well, number one thing is they're not achieving any less than they ever were going to achieve. They were always going to get A's. They're still getting A's. And they're still achieving. Okay? That's why I said, did you meet or exceed the standard? So if you exceeded it, we called it, you can call it whatever you want. We called it features. Did you add some features that were beyond the standard we had set for this. And that was just amazing. Kids were motivated to, to go beyond that. They'd come in with the coolest stuff. They'd, they would animate their whole project. <laughs> they would uh, use color and do stuff that we, we weren't requiring. But just a simple human request psychologically causes you to want to achieve that. See? And when they would make that breakthrough, we give them the opportunity to, to share that. I say, would you share that with that? That's a that's amazing breakthrough on what you just did. I haven't seen anybody do that. And would you share that with us? But when they share, are they sharing the journey? Okay, how'd you do it? If you simply stand somebody up and say, "Oh, this is an A plus 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 person," see. The, the, the implication is they're smart and you're not, <laughs> and you're never going to get there. So what's, what do we do with that? Call him a nerd. Brown noser. Dweeb. Okay? The system causes that defective Lord of the Flies behavior to come out. I know this because we've eliminated this in many, many schools. You don't hear those things. There's no bullying. Behavior problems go to practically nil. Virtually everybody performs at a very high level. You know what? Kids are extremely happy. And beyond that, teachers are extremely happy. Um, only one time in uh, six years did I ever have a parent complain because their daughter got an A. Think about that. You're going to have a parent come in and be really upset. My daughter got an A, and I, I want to talk to you about this. One time in six years, so that's about 1,000 kids that had flown, gone through this process, sat down with the mom and said, what's, what's the deal here? She said, well, my daughter got an A. I said, well, okay, let's listen to your daughter. She looked at her, took us through her portfolio, what they were learning, the level of performance. I said, amazing job. I asked the girl, I said, did you learn anything here? She said, oh, yeah, this is the most, I learned, learned most in this class I've ever had in any class. So I said to mom, I said, why are we here? She said, all those other kids got A's. I said, I know, I'm a master teacher. Other people are not able to achieve this. See, I, I said to her, you don't have any right to be concerned about those other kids. Your only concern is your daughter. She's not achieving? Well, we can work on that. 
But my job is to optimize the system with the 29 others. And if I can find a way to get them to a level of performance with your daughter, he, the crazy fact is because you got an A and it took him a little longer to get his A or get to that standard does not diminish your effort. You still put in effort, you still did that, and you still achieved at that performance. The only difference was he, he caused himself quite a bit of misery because he couldn't plan well and he didn't, uh, you know, dedicate his time. And see, but what he's going to learn very quickly is, whoa, next time I need to do that. I need to learn planning better and stay on track and cooperate with others. And if you think about this, if he knows that he's, this is difficult for him and he's maybe an assignment or two behind, right? Is he going to call him a nerd? No, I need him. See? Because I come in and say, how, how did you do that? How, did, how does this work? Tell me about that. But if I have an artificial scarcity of marks, okay, by grading on a curve, and he's got an A, and he asks for him for help, he can't help him. Subconsciously, he's, he's thinking, gosh, if I help him, he's going to get a better grade. I'm on the line between an A and a B. I could go down by helping him. Kids figure this out like that. Yes. Yeah, you can make. Yeah, you can pick whoever you want to stop you within the system, make all the kind of excuses. I was in Australia one time, and a teacher came up to me one of the breaks, and he said, "You know, I really like to do this." He said, and I, "I lecture all the time in my classes," and he says, "I know the kids hate it, but I'm getting them ready for the university." He's, he was really proud of that. Okay, one dysfunctional thing does not <laughs> help another dysfunctional. Thing in the process. So you have to think about well, if you want to break out of that and help other people break out of that system, how far can you go within the confines of the process and the system until you reach critical mass? Deming said you need critical mass. And that's, that's really only the square root of the organization. And staff 25, I only need five dedicated people and we can break out of this system. No, it's, it's, he said, is it difficult or to implement it? No, it's simple. All you got to do is put ones. <laughs> yeah, the operational definition is very important because that's, you're no longer talking apples and oranges. The education is fraught with games, guessworks, and gimmicks. And it's built into the system on purpose to make sure everybody doesn't achieve. Because if you take out all the games, gimmicks, and guesswork, performance goes up. Everybody's able to get the same result. Psychologically, last hundred years, we have built these things in on purpose. And today, they've been so institutionalized, people can't even see it anymore. They're just victims of their own reality. Okay, you just described a system that doesn't understand its purpose. It doesn't understand why it exists. It doesn't understand that learning is the product of the system. 
and therefore we should work with students to create a high-level learning system. It's, it, the system's got so convoluted over time that it's lost its purpose. It's now interested in entrepreneurial kinds of things for professors and research and st stuff over here. That's what you described, and all I can do is go on what you tell me. Okay, what you said is we don't have time to do what's right for students because our professors are so busy doing all this other stuff. So all I'm saying is you're going to have to make a choice. Okay? Do you want to have researching entrepreneurial professors, or do you want to improve learning for students? Well, I'm not on a bad note. I'm just telling you exactly the system will do. People will respond whatever the system is. I know, I know, I know, well, I'm just saying that it'll, uh, okay. I'm not trying to be confrontational, but go ahead. Okay. And I apologize, Brian. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to shut her down. But, <laughs> and I'm not trying to be confrontational. People people get very emotional about this because they want to defend the system that they're in. But you only have to look at your results. And I, I have no idea what your results are. Your results might be sterling, in which you have no reason to change anything. On the other hand, if you've got high degrees of people failing not achieving, not being successful at the next level, then you have to relook at the system because all the problem is in the system, not the individuals. You want a different result? You've got to change the system. That's, that's all I'm saying. So I'm, well, I, I always tell teachers, if you're happy with your results, hey, be happy. Just keep doing the same thing you've been doing with a whistle on your lips and come every day to work and be happy. But don't blame the students for poor performance because 98% of the result comes from the system itself of which you are the manager and only you can change it. Even if students tell you what the problem is that 40% of professors can't speak English well, if you're not willing to do anything about it, the system's not going to change. You're just going to continue to have people not understanding professors. What, what's the purpose of the system, and do we have that cl clear in everybody's minds, and now are you aligning processes to achieve that purpose? That's already happening. See? Organizations will naturally start to form around a purpose and be able to do things, and then they start to get unhappy with the result they're getting. <laughs> okay, well, you have to go back to the core. What, what was the purpose to begin with? Now, if we get that clear, then we have to look at every process that we have in relationship to that and say, you know, what's happening. So uh, I'm just going to leave you today because this, this is actually, you know, a 10-day process. But I'll just show you a set of results that happened with us inside a grading system. I always share this with people. Uh, I, I met Dr. Deming in 1986, and we started talking about these kinds of things, and this is what was happening in required classes. This is A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. About 10% of kids get A's, about 30 to 40% people would fail. And I thought I was a really tough teacher. Now I know I was just 
stupid. <laughs> but I didn't know that. I was ignorant, not stupid. And uh, so we started changing things. And we started doing experimentation, trying to get people to understand how to look at the system differently. And you can see data changes. Okay? But still, even though we're changing a lot of stuff, doing teams and process and tools and getting feedback from students, something else has to change. You've got to have a new theory. Okay? Without a new theory, you can only just improve efficiency, but you don't become effective in a whole new plane because the current system won't allow it. So after three years of that, we said, what's our new theory? Well, our new theory became this thing with the ones. What, happen, what happens if we just do this and then let everybody try to get to that level? But we said, well, we still got to have grades. You see? And so we went to that percentage thing, percentage of ones that you have by the end of a time period, that's your grade. And look what happened. Immediately, 60% of the kids jumped to getting A's or doing A-level work. Just by doing that, we changed that system. So then we got together and said, what's the next theory? <laughs> this is a PDSA cycle right here. Took a whole year working that through. It said, okay, what's the next theory? Next theory is, what if we just took away all other options except high performance? And if you're not performing at that level, you get tons of help. So work on the process by which performance comes. If you don't get high performance from everybody with an acceptable level of variation, they get help to get there. It may take some longer than others, but they can get there. And look what happened. 90 to 95% of the kids started getting there. We had special, still had special cause kids, you know, kids that had major social issues and problems and things like that we had to work with. But you can see the difference in this world. You can spend a huge amount of money helping special causes because they truly are special. They're so unusual, they need special intervention. Okay. But most of the dysfunction is coming from the system. As long as we kept running the system, going to keep right on getting it. I, I, I was happy with that until I met Dr. Deming. <laughs> and he made me very unhappy with that. He said, no, it doesn't have to be that way. As long as you keep doing that, you'll keep getting what, you, what you've been getting. Something different, you've got to have a different theory. And you've got to have prediction, test your theory, and go again. Okay. So it, it can happen. It can break out of the system. They get help. All kinds of things, all kinds of things happen because they are so such special causes. I investigated every one of them. We gave them help. We did all kinds of things. One kid just said, he said, I didn't think you were serious. He said, I really thought at the end of the semester you're gonna give me a C. I said, Well, you're serious. I said, What do you want to do about this? You know, and just you know, want extra help in the summer or what do you want to do? He said, I'll just come back and take the class again next year. He did. Got an A. Had nothing to do with ability. He was just playing this game. Had another girl who said, oh, my mother died, and I'm having to take care of my brother and sister and get them ready for school and put them to bed at night. And it's really, you know, I can't get all this stuff done. He said, okay, what can we do to help you? We got her tutors, got her help. We did whatever we could do to help them. You know, and... There were attitude. There were some kids that just said, screw you, I'm just not going to do it, and stuff like that. And there were special causes, is the point. But you're spending most of your time and effort on common cause performance. What's enabling the optimization of the system? Yeah, is there more work to be done? Absolutely. 90, 95% of kids doing A's is not good enough, especially if your child's in the 5%. So once you really understand the purpose is learning, and we're going to do everything we can in the system to optimize learning, and we're going to take away all the barriers that are preventing learning from happening, you find out motivation is not the problem. People are already well motivated. They want to do a good job. But the system's put so many barriers in place that will prevent people from doing a good job. And by the time they get to universities or they get to high schools, et cetera, they look like apathetic people that don't care. And so we look at them and we say, look, there's one. He's not motivated. But they've been so beaten by the system for 8, 10, 12, 14 years. See? 
how could they, Deming often said that, how, how could they be motivated? Yeah, I call them, uh, uh, label them SD, systems disabled. All right, th thanks very much.